Okay, so we're gonna we're gonna talk about how to deliver the best e-commerce experience on a on a budget. Um, so my name is Lee Woodman. I run a company called Visit Digital, and I'm one of the the coaches on the accelerated growth program. So these are some of the the topics we're gonna look at today. So choosing your e-commerce platform, uh, competitor research, uh, how to structure your store to maximize search engine exposure, and how you can convert more visitors to buy your products. So, so these are some of the platforms which uh, you may or may not be familiar with. So you've got some of the big hitters, kind of enterprise grade Magento, big commerce is making some, some gains at the moment. Shopify is you know, very much on the move. It's kind of industry leader um, and, and very simple. And, you know, we've got some of the... Uh, go on, sorry. Somebody... I, um, I'm just in the middle of a webinar at the moment. Can I call you back? Oh. <laughs> oh, oh you go. Sorry, I'll, I'll continue. Yeah, that's fine. Um, and we've got WooCommerce, which is, uh, which is powered by uh, WordPress. Okay. So, you know, the, the e-commerce game is, is well and truly on. So, um, you know, this is our first lockdown. So a lot of confidence dropped out of the e-commerce market. You know, not many people knew what was going to happen. You know, should we buy product? Should we stock? You know, what, what's, what's going on? Um, and then very quickly, I think some of the key players, especially people who, you know, were already selling on e-commerce, they could see, you know, the demand was in the market. People were buying products. And, you know, the, the market's kind of exploded out of here, you know, so it's uh, very much um, growing. You know, people are, are, are transacting far more online. Um, and, you know, it, it seems to be uh, no let up in, in the demand at the moment. So hampers, as an example, that market is up 300%. And paddle boards were the top trending retail item in July you know, as more people are looking to probably stay in the UK for their holidays and, you know, looking for things to do and purchase online and, you know, water sports, that kind of thing. Um, so, you know, the, the temptation for a new e-commerce website is you kind of just get straight in, start choosing colours and, you know, you start designing. But it's very easy to get caught up in the, the layouts, the designs and the colors of your website, because this, this is how we kind of relate to websites ourselves. It's like, you know, you want to make sure it looks good, which is fair enough, but we, we need to take a step back and, um, you know, basically do market research. So, you know, the question to ask yourself is how we're, how we're going to design this? How are we going to be represented in the channels which drive traffic to our businesses? So, you know, this is happy beds, this is bunk beds. So, you know, if you think of your products and services, how is it going to be represented in the context of Google, Facebook, you know, LinkedIn, Instagram? Um, because the reality is, unless you get somebody to click on this or your Instagram post or your Facebook post, it doesn't matter how good the website is on the other side. Uh, they're never going to see it, you know? So, so we, we need to kind of take a step back from this kind of visual design side of things for the moment and think about how we should structure our website. And ultimately, you know, what does the customer actually want? And we need to align our propositions to that. So I'm going to give you a quick test. So I'm going to I'm going to flash up a Google search result, and I want you to tell me or have a think um, what this company actually does. Yeah. So that's probably how long you've got to interact with somebody in a search result. So I'll give you another look at it. So Turtle Home Original. Yeah. So okay. So you know you may have picked up they do social media monitoring. But the reality is this is what captivates or this is what catches our attention in the search results. So, you know, if we made it look like this instead, it's far more compelling, catches your eye. We know what they do instantly. And when you put yourself against 10 other competitors in the Google search results, you know, you, it's clear what you do. 
And, you know, in the example of happy beds here, we can see bunk beds, bunk beds for kids and adults, happy beds is their brand and a great range of bunk beds for kids and adults. Very, very important that we can articulate in the context of search social what we do and allow people to understand it very easily. So the, t the typical kind of e-commerce build process is that, you know, you go to an agency and the agency's expectations that you're going to bring market insight, you know, all you understand about the customer to the process and the client's expectation of the agency is that you, they're going to bring you a digital strategy for you. It's rare that combination happens to the, um, you know, it, everyone's expectations are managed, you know, it's um, that this customer insight generally gets dropped from the, from the equation. So the agency is expecting the client to bring all their market and um, understanding of their, their customer. But the reality is, unless the client is, you know, fully understands their client's search habits and how they interact with their products online, this kind of digital marketing insight, if you like, very much, very often gets missed from the process of building any website, you know, whether it's e-commerce or, you know, whatever it is. So, you know, th this is a critical stage for inclusion in this process. Now, agencies are getting better at doing this and, you know, I don't want to paint a broad brush, um, but generally, you know, th that gets, that gets missed out. Um, so, I used to work for um, a publishing company and, you know, I was kind of head of SEO there. So they would, when I first started working there, you know, nine o'clock in the morning, I get a tap on the shoulder. We're launching our website today. Well, you know, and, and the question was, can you do some SEO for us? Now, who is, who has made all of this, who, who's made all of these decisions, you know, requirements, analysis, collect the data, um, you know, from a digital marketing perspective, we have to be involved at this stage, this planning, understand what the market looks like. Um, and, and that kind of insight needs to feed into um, the web build process because it's, it's absolutely critical. Otherwise, there's going to be information there which will get missed out. And what, what quite often happens is that when you start looking at the data around your markets and your products, you can identify things that... Um, people who have been running businesses for 20 years don't know about their customers and that that data is extremely valuable at this kind of planning phase where you can actually build this insight into the, into the process. The problem, if you do it at this point, is that development's happened, design has happened, and it's very difficult to kind of reverse engineer uh, this insight into a website at this late stage. So the, the, the quicker you get that into this planning process, the cheaper it will be down the side. And from day one, you kind of, you know, you're, you're in the game that the website is aligned with the marketplace. Um, you know, the, these are kind of the top e-commerce traffic drivers for most businesses, you know, Google organic search, direct traffic. So maybe they, they typed in your brand name, um, email lists, Google ads, um, organic and paid social. And then you've got, you know, the outlier kind of search engines like Bing. So, you know, we need to be thinking about strategies for pretty much each of these channels. Now for most businesses, they're going to get most of their sales from Google organic and Google paid search. So, you know, it's very important to think about the website in the context of those channels. Like how is it going to perform in Google organic? How is it going to, you know, perform when we drive specific traffic at it from paid search. So think about, you know, our landing page experience, you know, when we're, when we're bidding on terms like, I don't know, luxury hampers, what is the experience going to look like when somebody lands on, on that website? And again, from Facebook, you know, how are we going to represent um, our products and services inside those channels? Yeah. So where do we start? Well, it's, it's, research 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 you you have to get a grip on the customer might sound obvious and if, if you've been if you've been doing this for a very long time and you're just transitioning to um, selling online 
that there are things in the, the data which you just will not know about your customer. Um, it's it's a, kind of as simple as that, really. There, there'll be things in there which are very different to how you perceive your customer um, offline versus online. And we can find all this stuff out. And you know, ultimately, you're going to get competitive advantage if you if you do do that. So there are tools out there like SEMrush. Uh, SEMrush, you've got Moz, you've got various platforms which can give us insights on competitors. Now, this is a website called Carbuyer. So we built this in I think 2011, and you know, specifically targets the the car market, um, trying to capture people at the point of researching for new cars. So I can see, you know, this is completely third party data. Anybody can view this with a with a subscription, um, but we can see, you know, they're probably doing about 1.2 million people a month from Google organic search. They're not, they've had a couple of little blips of paid search traffic. So they've done a couple of paid search campaigns, but generally this traffic is, is organic. It's grown pretty consistently over time. And, you know, I, if, if I'm going into this space, I want to know that. I want to know how successful some of these websites are. And crucially, I want to know what search terms are driving traffic to those so that I can, that can help me shape how I build my website or my offering. Yeah. So, you know, what, what drives traffic allows you to understand um, yeah, demand, you know, what's the demand for the products that I sell? So I can see with Car Buyer, we've got 201,000 different search terms that drive traffic on that website. Now, that's a pretty massive list. I certainly don't wanna go through that. Um, but what we do know is that 98% of the traffic that arrives at Car Buyer is on non-brand search terms. So a, a non-brand search is where somebody has not used the word car buyer in their search query. So if you think about, um, you know, building brand is, is a big job, it's quite hard. There's a lot of heavy lifting required to get somebody to actually search for your brand name in Google. You have had to either have done like conference in PR, given them somebody business card um, versus a non-brand search query where, you know, they've never heard of car buyer, but they're interested in a Ford Fiesta review. Um, there are a lot more people who do this kind of search than branded search. So the, the opportunity for your business to chase this non-brand traffic is a much quicker way to build your brand. Um, so, you know, I, I think Happy Beds, which I mentioned earlier, not my client, by the way, um, they, they, it's something like 94% of their traffic comes from non-brand search. So quite similar to car buyer. Now, I don't know about you, but I can't remember the last time I saw an advert on TV for happy beds. I can, I remember seeing one for dreams, Benson's for beds, those kind of companies, but I don't remember seeing one for happy beds. Now I suspect if you looked at dreams in the same way as this, the percentage of branded traffic would be much higher. Same for Benson for Beds. They've done that, or they're, they're doing that heavy lifting, um, trying to grow their brands. Whereas Happy Beds and Car Buyer are focused on non-brand traffic because there's exponentially more of it in the market, and it's cheaper to go and get it. Is uh, is what it boils down to. Um, so let's, you know, quick little uh, test here. So. This is the, um, you can still see my screen, okay, uh, Lisa? Yeah, we're uh, good. Okay, so this is Carbide. This is their Ford Fiesta hatchback review page. So I'm a competitor coming into this market. I'm interested in, you know, taking some market share. I need to try and understand my customer um, in, this, in the context of, of buying a car. So I, I need to try and fully understand what they're doing. So I've been on to SEMrush and I have downloaded all the keyword data that is driving traffic at the car buyer website and all of the terms that include the word Ford. So for example, you know, I stripped out the word Ford Fiesta ZTech. So I've stripped out Ford Fiesta because at this 
this point is not really of interest to me. I'm just interested in the additional terms that people search for. So, you know, and this, I think there's 3,000 terms here, yeah, 2,100 terms. Again, I don't really want to look through that massive list to try and understand what the audience is doing. So we can take all that data, put it into something called Tag Crowd, visualize it. And this kind of shows us the high value or the most frequently used terms, review, specs, uh, MPG, price, problems, engine, additions, deals. Um, what else we got? Finance, insurance, interior. Okay. So we've, we've quickly taken this data set and we've put it into Tag Crowd and we want to, that, that, now gives us the opportunity to go, okay, well, we kind of understand what people are looking for in the context of looking for a Ford Fiesta. It's all these things. Now, if we look at the car buyer website, as an example, it's not an accident that the site is structured in exactly that way. Right? Ford Fiesta hatchback review is the page. They've got content, or they've got pages on Ford Fiesta, MPG, running costs and CO2, um, engine drive performance, interior and comfort, practicality, boot space, reliability and safety, pictures, videos. It's because we know that is how people search for this product. Um, and we've, we've architected the website to basically exactly align with that, um, with that audience. Yeah, so the, the site architecture is driven by our understanding of the customer from the data. Very different way of building a website. So bear in mind the company that, that owned this product, Dennis Publishing, you know, one of the main automotive publishing companies pretty much in the world. And they understand, they understand this audience. Now, when we built it, to some extent, we didn't really take any input from the editorial team to some extent. We purely based it on the data that was available to us in the likes of SEMrush and places like that because we wanted to fully understand how people look for these products. Now I'm sure editors, you know, could have um, could have come up with a lot of these, but it's the little outliers which they generally don't come. And so um, Sorry, I think my daughter's playing with my phone, so she's triggering my uh, alarm on my watch. Uh, so again, you know, we're looking for the commercial intent um, when we're when, when we're trying to build our site structure around our products. So you know, if, if we're looking at selling Ford Fiestas, we're not going to particularly be interested in highlighting their problems. Yeah, you know, we're going to be interested in you know showing what their MPG is, showing what the interior looks like, showing what the review you know a review, what deals we've got, what finance options. And so you're trying to get fully kind of engaged and in the head of your, your customer. So you're trying to build this keyword universe, essentially. And, and this is what often gets missed in the relationship between client and agency. It's, it's this kind of analysis and deep dive into the customer, which is not presented to the agency. And likewise, the agency may not present it back either. Um, so there we go. Yeah, as, I, as I said here, this is not a random choice that we're doing. We know, uh, we know this is how people search. So most e-commerce companies try and acquire their customers at the point where they're ready to buy. And it's very, very expensive compar comparatively to acquire them at that stage. It's like right at the point of purchase, you know, I want to buy a hamper, you go and grab them at that point, or you want to buy a Ford Fiesta, you know, trying to get them at that point, everybody is trying to get them at the same time. So it's very expensive. Whereas if you come down to awareness, um, then, you know, it's a bit cheaper consideration, a bit more expensive, but again, a bit cheaper. And ultimately you want to try and build loyalty and service because these are the cheapest times to kind of reacquire people. So let's have a quick look at this. So Nason's uh, based over in Neath. 
So they sell castor oils as their product. Now, again, you know, there's another 50 companies that also sell castor oil. Uh, may not be as good as this one, may not have the same credentials as this one, but, you know, I could go most of the places to buy this. Again, if I'm, if I'm trying to target people right at the point of purchase, it is very expensive uh, to do that. So they've started doing some supporting content, okay? So benefits and uses of castor oil. Now they've got the product and this is more about everything you need to know about castor oil and what you can do with it. So, you know, they talk about, I think, uh, versatility for your hair, you know, use on your lips. I mean, I didn't know you could use it in your hair. Maybe I should have done that 10, 15 years ago and I might've had some left, but you know, a lot, lot of benefits. Um, so they're, they're kind of supporting the story and they're backing up why you need this product, what it can do for you. So within the first month of this article going online, um, I think this article, although you can't necessarily directly attribute it to cost, it had been involved in the e-commerce purchase. So people have been looking at this article prior to actually buying the product. I think within the first month, it did about two grand worth of revenue um, as a kind of indirectly supporting the purchase. You know, so kind of gives you some idea of the value of this kind of content because people typing in, you know, buy castor oil today or buy, cost, buy castor oil now, um, there's a finite number of those people versus what are the benefits of castor oil? What can it do for my hair? How do I make my hair stronger? That kind of generic top of the funnel, hundreds of thousands of people exist there. Um, that's where the volume is and that's where kind of the scale opportunity for, for businesses is. And then you've got videos like this, which, I mean, I completely randomly came across it, um, but somebody had basically put this video up of, use this, I mean, it's palm oil, but again, it's a, uh, you just skip this. Um, it's uh, it's palm oil, but they put it up back in August, I think. And you can see here, she just links to Nasons. This, this, you know, there's no influencer involved here. This is just an organic article or organic video, and she's linked off to our product. Within the first week, I think it did eighty five thousand views, and this this link here is driving about hundred people back to. Um, back to the Nasons website. Interestingly, they're not converting because they're a US audience and we don't have US pricing. But, um, you know, that, it's kind of this support, you're supporting this funnel. Yeah, so it's very expensive here. You want to be thinking about how you can support your products with types of content where, you know, how it, how they, how it can relate to them, how, how it's useful for those, um, those people. Yeah. Um, so this, this is where site structure is kind of very important in your kind of e-commerce and e-commerce journey. So we need to think hard about how we structure the website. So if we take the BBC as an example and Manchester United, it's not an accident that their site is structured in this way. So we've got, you know, BBC homepage, BBC Sport, Premier League, Manchester United and all the supporting Manchester United content below fixtures results players news it is is purely based on customer and market data we know that there are nearly a million people a month that search for manchester united news now from a from a user experience perspective we have to have that page on our website so people can engage directly with manchester united news it's no good as putting you know players at the top of that page because they're you know, they're not interested in it at that kind of stage of their journey. They want news. You know, so again, site structure, it's very much needs to be supported by, um, you know, your understanding of your market coupled with how we know that your customer searches for your products. You know, what, what, what will happen if you don't do this is that the website will probably underperform. You know, so I, I quite often get brought in with startups where you know, maybe they're a year or two down the line and they're like, yeah, we're not getting any leads or, you know, we're not selling any products. And when you look at the structure of the website, it's, it's just not aligned to how their customers actually search for 
what they do. That sounds bizarre, but that, that is quite often the case. You know, so they, they can be experts at their product, but they can't, um, you know, they, they, can't, they, they don't necessarily understand how people search for what they do. So this kind of research helps with that. Um, you, you've got to speak the same language. Yeah? So consultants in the healthcare space, especially, like to use big words like lip augmentation for selling their lip fillers. In yeah? the market, that's not how they search. So 1,300 people a month search for lip augmentation, 33,000 people search for lip fillers. So what happened about, I think, three years ago when I was looking at this space is that you got these really weird kind of an authoritative website ranking for lip fillers, lip filler services, that kind of thing, because none of the consultants wanted to talk on their website in that language. So they were just missing out basically, you know, and we can see here, this is low competition from a Google ads perspective. Um, it's not how you customer search your products. Yeah, so you can see this, this is more people that search at this point. Um, so the quicker you can align with your customer, the quicker you're going to get into the market and selling your products. So here's four examples. Um, this is Dennis publishing. This is Auto Express. So this is what happened when we very much led with a news strategy. So, you know, a new Ferrari would get launched and we do a million people in one day versus uh, but the next day we might do you know 10,000 people because that kind of news is gone so very kind of spiky traffic versus we switched it to a data-driven approach like car buyer and you know immediately started to see the benefits of that because we aligned the website with what we knew people wanted to read about and engage with um, and you know that that is that's the difference between kind of finger in the air, we think people are going to want to read about this versus let's take a data-driven approach first. Let's make sure website aligns with that. Then let's build on top of that with, you know, a bit of blue sky thinking, um, creative, if you like. Uh, this this one is a, a restructure of an e-commerce website where, and this is, a, this is a rare engagement actually, where somebody was just about to rebuild their website but they did a technical audit of an, um, kind of a digital strategy audit of the of their current website, so they, they knew what was wrong with that, so they didn't make the same mistakes the next time. And again, you know, this 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 growth here is about 150 grand a month from organic search, and you know, times 12, and then yeah, this you know, so they they kind of they wanted to know what was wrong with their current site, you know, and that's the difference. This one. Uh, this is a jobs website, I think. And, you know, so they came to, I think this is the start of it and this is the growth and then this is how it continued. Um, but they came to us very early on and it's like, look, we want to go into this market. How do we target our customers? What are they doing? How should we structure the website? And, you know, before we engage with any web developers or designers, it's looking at the kind of research I've shown you previously what, what are they doing? How do they search for our products? And how do we build that into our site structure? So from day one, as soon as you switch the website on, you're in the market. You may not be ranking particularly well, but you, you know you're in it from day one. And this is why I said you know, a few minutes ago about startups, you know, a year or two down the line, they think they're in the market, but they're not. You know? So, um, quicker you get in there the better you know give you give yourself the best chance of actually you know, being successful um, as quickly as possible and then listen out for trends like this is google for jobs so you know they, they're obviously interested in recruitment here they turned on some functionality which supports google for jobs and you know traffic went crazy off the back of that so, you know, understanding your customer is critical and, you know, it's the cheapest way to grow your business. You don't want to be infinitely spending money on Google ads or Facebook ads to some extent. There's, there's reasons why you might, but, you know, if we look at, um, if we look at how I stop my screen, can I get off here? Yeah. 
So if we look at happy beds, they don't they don't spend any money on paid search. Yeah, versus somebody like um, who have we got? I don't know. Dot com. Yeah, a big a big percentage of their audience is coming in from paid search. So, so they they pay into acquire customers. Not necessarily a bad thing if you, if your ROI is is good, but Happy Beds have taken the approach where you know they are they, they've invested in organic search and they don't need to, they don't really need to bring anybody in. Looks like they've tried a couple of small campaigns here, but it's all driven by organic. You know, it's, they they fully understand the customer. So interestingly, don't know whether I can show it here. No, I'll skip that one. Um, so let's go back in. Okay, so when we talk about site structure, so this is ultra wave. Um, now, you know, when it comes to ultra wave, ultra waves products, nobody is searching for the U five hundred. Yeah, it's not a or the U one hundred. Yes, it's not a thing somebody is searching for. What they what they are searching for is ultrasonic cleaners for dental. Yeah, ultrasonic cleaners for car repair shops. You know, so you need to think about how your customers actually use your products. Um, and again, how do we know that we need to kind of align in that way? Well, this, the the data tells us that. So. You know, ultrasonic clean of your teeth, that's probably a toothbrush, so not there's no commercial intent there. Ultrasonic dental cleaner, mm, interesting. Ultrasonic dental cleaner near me, ultrasonic dental cleaning machine. Okay, it's only 10 people a month in the market, but that's just on that phrase. So we've got another 10 here then, ultrasonic cleaner for dental office. Yeah, so again, researching and, and understanding this kind of insight helps shape how you your, your offering. Yeah. Um, and how do you do that? So you just start in Excel. So this is where, forget the pretty pictures, forget the, you know, what goes where and your brand to some extent. You purely come in to get an Excel sheet and you start writing down, well, I need a homepage. I need some FAQs. I need an about us. Um, I need a contact page. I need some pricing information. And then, you know, these are going to be all my products, whatever that is. And, you know, in, in the example of kind of ultra wave, we're going to do it by sector. So we're going to talk to the industries or people that are interested in our products and how they use them in the context of them. And yeah, this quite often gets missed out. So this kind of sector side of it, you know, it's like naissance, you know, you can have all these cool products but you're relying on people purchasing them at the very point where they need it um, versus taking a step back and going, well, you can use castor off your hair. Okay, let's do some content around that to support the product. And then you kind of build this authority around that subject area. And that's, you know, there's, there's exponentially more traffic um, at that kind of stage of purchase. Yeah. Um, so let's come through. So, you know, once you've done that and you've done that exercise, then it is like, okay, we can start thinking about what platform we're actually going to build this thing on. So how complex is the product or service? You know, you know, are you selling socks or new cars? If you're selling socks, um, as we've got somebody on the, on the call does today, you know, you need a simple solution. You don't need complexity and something like Shopify, WooCommerce, BigCommerce, those kind of platforms can do that. If you're selling cars, you're probably going to need customization. And that is where something like Magento comes into play. Um, I've got a love-hate relationship with Magento, but we'll talk about that in a bit. You know, custom builds, you want to avoid, <laughs> you've, you've, you've got to avoid custom builds. You know, you don't want to go down a route where it's like you're trying to reinvent the wheel. Um, you know, you start with off the shelf and you try your best 
to get what you do being you know compatible with something like Shopify or WooCommerce. Because as soon as you get down the custom built route, you know, you, you are effectively reinventing the wheel and you know there's going to be little intricacies of web development which you know you, you're going to kind of come a cropper on trying to support or build into your platform. Um, think about integrations, make it easy for yourself. You know, you want it integrating with your accounting platform so that at the end of the month you click a button and it does all your billing for you. Um, you know, think about your mail or your, your email newsletter integrations, MailChimp, and then abandon basket. So if somebody starts your checkout process, gives you their address, and then for whatever reason they, they check out, you can ping them an email, you know, a day later and say, hey, you know, you've left some stuff in your basket. Um, and it will re really kind of initiate uh, that checkout process. So, you know, you need to decide how much control you actually want over its functionality. Again, Shopify, very, very simple. Um, you know, it's being built to transact. That's my kind of thought of it versus WordPress and WooCommerce, where WooCommerce, you know, is kind of an afterthought. Um, and it's pretty good. But something like Shopify uh, is, is what it does. It sells products, you know. Think about your support and then how SEO friendly is it. So it's got to be fast. This is key, fast, fast speed. You know, a tenth of a second for Amazon costs them $1.6 billion lost revenue every year. That's a tenth of a second. You know, most websites I deal with are seconds too slow. You know, so there's this big opportunity around that. Um, yeah, and, you know, you need to have control. You, you need to be able to change and edit things. So some of the platforms kind of talked about those earlier. So I'm going to skip that one. We don't really need to uh, talk about that. If, if, you've, if you're talking about like the technology, you know, you're, if you are high traffic, high revenue, this is a conversation to be had. But at this stage, for most companies, we don't need to go down that route. You know, do you need a website? There's, you've got Amazon, you've got Etsy, you've got eBay. You know, a lot of businesses, if they are solely reliant, they can be solely reliant on Amazon. They're effectively an Amazon company and they move their kind of paid media budget inside Amazon because the commercial intent from that audience is that they're ready to buy. You know, they've gone to Amazon. They know it's a retailer or they know it's an e-commerce retailer. They're, they're ready to buy. So why spend your money anywhere else when you can target an audience which is it's in the buy mode? Yeah, you've got to test, measure, learn, and you just repeat that process forever. You know, it's like customers change, trends change. So you've got to have KPIs. You, know, you need to know what's going on with the website. How many people did you get today? How much money did you make today? You need to know that every day. Um, and then, you know, if you need to quickly kind of experiment or you, you quickly need to get sales, so you're just, if you're a startup, maybe you've been funded, it's like, right, we've got a website ready, you need to get to market tomorrow. Well, paid marketing of Facebook is an opportunity to do that. Again, you have to have this in place to do that. If anybody is selling you Google ads and they are not able to tell you what the return on your investment was, switch it off today. You know, it's, you, you have to know that. You've got to know the ROI. Um, so if you are going into paid advertising, what's your budget? What percentage of your margin are you willing to give up to acquire that customer? And, you know, again, if you're working with ad agencies, cost per acquisition. So, you know, I'm spending my money. How much is it costing me to acquire that customer? You know, with Shopify and most e-commerce platforms, it's easy to get this figure. So anybody not giving it to you doesn't understand the tools that, you know, are industry standard. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, what are your competitors doing? So are they bidding in paid advertising? Because if they are, that can give you some confidence to do as well. Yeah. So again, with the likes of SEMrush, you can see what they're bidding on and how long they've been bidding for. I mean, this is John Lewis, but still, we know they're spending half a million quid. Uh, they're bidding on 6,000 keywords-ish, and they've been doing it for a long time. So let's dig into that data and let's, you know, let's kind of, let's, let's do what they're doing. 
you know so think how much learning and money they've spent refining these campaigns so let's avoid all that learning and let's jump in at this point and go okay what are they bidding on today yeah um just check how we're doing for time okay so on-site search so this is one of my favorite things about e-commerce what people are searching in this box yeah so castor oil search amazon search is absolutely fundamental to e-commerce it's probably the most underinvested technology that is on any website you this this is customers telling you what they want from your website from your products the little intricacies around your products you know maybe they want a different size or you know what whatever it is this box is absolutely fundamental so you know you've got to invest there so you know if they can't find it they can't buy it you know so for e-commerce site searches for me, it's like the first thing I look at with most websites. It's the first thing that I can find opportunity in. So we've got three three different websites here. We can see that people who don't search convert to 1.6% for these guys. Uh, visits with search, double, quadruple, and whatever that is, four, four or five times more. And so if you get if you get people to search, they're far, far more likely to convert to sale these are some of the key technologies that you can you can use um i mean we've done a site search improvement for a client recently <coughs> you, you you go from good to amazing is 10 percent more revenue yeah and that's just going from good to amazing if you go from poor to amazing you know who knows what that looks like um so Okay, I'll send these slides around, but web chat is a key one. You've got to be able to talk to people. Um, a lot of companies, you know, I interact with, it's like, no, we, 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 haven't got, we haven't got web chat on. And it's like, well, you're not answering the phones as well, you know, because it's that, for me, it is as important as just ignoring the phone call. You know, people want to interact with you. They want to ask you questions. You've got to facilitate. You've got to facilitate that. Um, and you need to think about reviews, you know, your review strategy. So you, you very need to quickly get social proof that your website and your products are good and they're trusted because people make their decisions to purchase based on reviews. You know, it's unfortunate. You know, you can game it, but the reality is people, you know, they make their, they make their decision there. So, um, you know, if we take this as an example, so we're, we're all familiar with this. This is not Nason's data, by the way. Um, but if you take, you know, when you, when you run a brand search, so search for Nason's, this box appears on the right hand side. This is Google My Business. Now, the first thing people see is, is your review score. It's 35, 34. You know, if you've got one five star review, you know, you're not giving me much confidence. If you've got, one or if you've got 10 one or two star reviews you know i'm out with that pretty quickly so managing your reputation online is is very very important um everybody should sign up for google my business you know for this particular client six percent of their revenue comes from um that link yeah so um for this client 0.37 percent of their revenue comes from there yeah so it's generally I, I think Nasos may be around the 1%, half percent to 1%. Um, so you can see, you know, it's very, very valuable source of data. Um, so, yeah, get that, get reviews, think about your strategy around how you're going to acquire those. So go and check out the Google Rater Guidelines. Yeah, so before you start on your kind of web journey, Google Rater Guidelines and the Google e-commerce playbook, two like critical things which you need to be looking at. Um, so for the Rater Guidelines, this is a Google document, it's about 170 pages. You don't need to read all that. You probably need to just digest the first 20 or 30 pages. But um, Google asks about 10,000 contractors to review this document and then 
kind of grade their results. Now, it doesn't directly impact the search results. Google just wants feedback from those people to understand how, um, how they're kind of surfacing it. So if you look down here, customer reviews. Customer reviews can be helpful for assessing the reputation of a store or business. You don't really need to read much further than that. Customer reviews can be helpful. You know, it's, it's they're asking for it. Yeah, so it says here, credible, convincing reports of fraud or financial wrongdoing is evidence of extremely negative reputation. You know, a single encounter with a rude clerk, you know, it's not considered negative. Use your judgment. They're trying to get the algorithm to interpret this stuff in the same way. Yeah, so again, don't put reviews up your business because it's very easy to uh, to kind of work that out. Um, but uh, this this document will give you some pretty good insight. They've, they've got something called the your money or your life. So they categorize websites in this way. So shopping websites are included in that. So sometimes the pages or topics could potentially impact the person's future happiness, health, or financial stability. So you need to be conveying your expertise, your authority, and your trust to your audience. So reviews, you know, contact information, don't hide that kind of stuff. Um, I know we're pushing the time here, so I'll uh, sign up for this. It's called Think with Google. You know, I rarely look forward to an email, but this is, I get, you know, weekly or daily digests from Think with Google about industry insights. It's very, very good. So you can see here consumer rising retail categories. What have we got? Squash. <clears throat> Didn't even know what that is. Um, costume and stage makeup. So these are top trending categories this month in the UK in the kind of retail space. Pumpkins, obviously. Um, you know, inflatable party decorations. Maybe that's Christmas coming, you know, gloves and mittens. Yeah. So again, valuable insight, which you can dig into. Um, yeah. Go start your, uh, your e-commerce journey. That's a hard stop, isn't it? <laughs> Thanks, Lee. I think you chance to take a breath a minute there with lots of uh, information. Uh, just a reminder about the to look out for the forms from me, please, with the hello sign sig uh, di digital signature. I have sent a private message out to some people. So if you haven't got your chat facility on, can you just check in there for me? Because I just need to check some names that are on the um, registration there. Um, and then we'll open up for some questions. I've, oh, I've just got two come up on the chat now. With regards to reviews, would you consider Trustpilot? Yeah, you know, trust Trustpilot and any third party reviews. So what Google has said recently, and I, I know we're talking about Google, but I think they've got the best, you can apply this to a lot of other um, channels as well. They, they've said that they, they're not really interested in reviews on your own website written by yourself. So in the text essentially of your website, um, they want third party reviews, Trustpilot, reviews.io, FIFO. So, you know, independently kind of verified sources of truth, if you like. Yeah, so I think it's fine to have testimonials on your site, but Trustpilot, FIFO, Google My Business Reviews, they are the key ones. Oh, yeah. uh, and we've got, we can read WooCommerce. Yeah, that's what made me laugh with Shoplift. I don't think we should. Uh... <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, so that's probably, you could probably configure that. That's more of a configuration issue. I don't think that necessarily warrants a move to Shopify. Um, that's more of a tracking issue. So I think, you know, that's that's a probably a reasonably quick fix, that one. Um, are you familiar with ECWID? No. No. Maybe we can uh, pick that one up after Martin. I don't know what that one is. Does anyone want to come off microphone or Martin, do you want to come off mic? Or anyone want to ask questions? Yeah, hi Lee. Hi everyone. Hi. hi. I was just looking at um, Equid. Um, you know, there's the, uh, like a plethora of sort of um, 
possibilities and um, of sort of like back ends to front ends that can be used. Um, I've looked at the customization route and, you know, like you say, it seems uh, fraught with difficulty and sort of like, you know, reinventing the wheel. Um, so the obvious thing to do is to choose one of these sort of back end platforms. Mm -hmm. And it's just trying to decide which one. So with the information you've given me today, it's helped. And, um, you know, I'm just going to go off and look a little deeper, I guess. Yeah, I mean, if you, if you sell a reasonably straightforward product, I mean, you, you don't want the hassle. That's the way I look at this. It's just got to be simple. You know, you don't want the hassle of having to, you know, work with developers long term to be able to sell your products. You know, like Shopify, for, you know, the Shopify WooCommerce, those platforms, this is what they're designed to do. You know, they're designed to sell product. You don't, you don't want to, you want to avoid that if you can, you know? Yeah. What I would like um, to do really is, is self-host it. So I'm sort of in control of, um, you know, the, the back end and the, the, the front end of the application. So I can, I'm responsible. So, so say, say if um, one of these businesses went out of business and um, I was left high and dry because I was reliant on their servers. Are you aware of any platforms that can be used other than Magento? Um, well, WooCommerce. WooCommerce? Okay. Yeah, yeah. So I mean, WooCommerce is, is, yeah, yeah. WooCommerce is basically WordPress. You know, it's a, it's a, it's a plugin for WordPress. It's pretty popular. Okay. Um, but again, do you want the hassle of that? That's the, you know, I, I if you can avoid any of that stuff, hosting it yourself, mm. managing it yourself, just avoid it because, I mean, I used to be a developer, so you know, developers love nothing more than getting stuck in and you know, making their own think. decisions, yeah. but it's, I don't know. You just, it's, it's complex enough selling products without having all that stuff, you know? Yeah. yeah. So, um, I'll, 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 I'll agree with you on that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think, uh, somebody's asked one of my views on Magento. <sighs> I've, I just haven't got anything good to say about it, to be honest. <laughs> it's, I mean, you know, I've had four projects in Magento and, you know, you pro bear in mind four projects, we've probably spent two million pounds yeah, on four projects. None of them have come out the other side pretty. I want to say pretty. Three of them we actually wrote off and we were in Shopify. You know, it's like, I, I, I we're in Shopify for a fraction of that cost, you know? a 20th of the cost. Um, you know, Magento, you've got to have, you've got to have a, a, a technical team to support you for starters, you know? So, so, you know, for some companies, it's the right choice, but it, it is more the customized route. You know, if you're selling, if you're selling socks, gloves, you know, anything which is just, you know, put in a box and send it, not with a barge pole, um, again, if you're selling cars on Shopify, it's probably not the right platform for you. Um, so what's, what's your views on Wix? Um, yeah, Wix is, in, is interesting, simple. It's got a CRM. Um, again, Wix wasn't designed to sell product. Um, I wouldn't write it. I wouldn't write it off. I mean, I, I my friend uses it to sell his flight school tickets. And I was, I was genuinely impressed with with its capabilities you know it's very much like everything's swimming in the same pool of data so that's that's quite good um so yeah we well, actually engaged a web developer who will begin work this january they will get SEO optimized for us what information should we be looking for to give them before they start the build so this again i'm painting a broad brush here but the last person you want to speak to if you want to build a website is a web developer or web designer, because then they, they are, that's what they are. They're developers and they're designers. They're not marketers. And if, unless you get that kind of marketing influence to begin with, um, yeah, I think, you know, you've, you've basically got to give them what you want them to build. You know, if your web developer is also a marketer and an SEO, and it does happen, you know. Um, yeah, good. But again, 
just uh, be mindful that they may not be looking at the commercialization kind of, you know, they may not understand the commercials of, of the audience and what they look for. Uh, how key is adding payment options like Apple Pay? Yes, yeah, key. Yeah, like 50% of transactions on one client go through PayPal. And again, you just want to make it simple. You know, it's, it's all about speed, basically. How quickly can you get people to check out? That's uh, simple. So uh, Shopify, I've got something called, I think, ShopPay. So if you check out and shop on one Shopify website, the next time you go on a Shopify website, um, you can just, you know, it's, it's there. It's, uh, you can check out one click. So um, can you recommend a platform for technical products? So probably talking downloads. Um, again, it's probably not Shopify's bag. Um, it's probably a WooCommerce, I reckon. There's probably a couple of plugins that you could get from WooCommerce to be able to do that very quickly. Um, what about Squarespace? Not had a particularly good experience with Squarespace for one client. Um, I think it's got a bit better recently. So, yeah, you know, again, I, I, I kind of come back to the e-commerce. What was the original idea of a platform? What was it designed to do? And you know, I'm always reluctant to move away to platforms where inherently they weren't designed for e-commerce because, you know, it's it's kind of the foundations of it are built to sell. So, but yeah, it's 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 all right. Transacts. Bab, I think that's it on there. Bang on time. Yeah. Look at that. Awesome. <laughs> Okay, with the um, slides, we can send them out, but we will need to sign your signatures back first before we can get the slides out to you. So uh, if anybody does want those, then just give us a shout when we um, send the signatures out. So I think that's everything. Uh, thanks, Lee, for giving up your time this morning and lots of information there. Hopefully, lots of info for everyone to go away with. Um, and. Just have a have a good rest of the week, everybody. And thanks for joining us this morning. So cool. have a good one. Thank you. Awesome. Bye. Thanks, Lee. Well done. Thank you. Bye. Cheers. Bye.